This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Watch me react to the grades that got me into MIT in this week's Nebula Plus video when you sign in for CuriosityStream and Nebula using my link. This week I am reacting to the application that got me into my MIT PhD program four years ago. If you're new here, I'm Jordan and I'm a PhD student at MIT as well as a YouTuber who makes videos about emerging tech, artificial intelligence, and what it's like to be a grad student. Consider subscribing if you want to check out more of my videos, and if you're interested in learning more about the specifics of my PhD program or how you apply to STEM PhD programs in the first place, I will link two videos that I did on those topics down below and up in the card. There will also be a Nebula Plus version of this video where I actually go through my undergrad transcript and react to that, so if you're interested in seeing what grades got me into MIT, you should check that out. Alright, so the two main documents that we're going to be looking at today are my CV from my undergrad and my personal statement. We'll actually start with my personal statement, so if you're not familiar, most programs require you to submit a personal statement that essentially outlines why you're interested in applying to the program, what you are interested in doing if you get into your program, whose labs you might want to work in, things like that. And so my personal statement was actually essentially based around my journey into science. Uh, specifically my journey with something called reactive hypoglycemia, where my body has a delayed response to a rise in glucose levels in my body, and so essentially I end up having these really sharp blood sugar crashes um, that were a big problem in high school because I would, you know, be falling asleep at my desk because of it. Now, there's a lot of debate, I think, within academia as to whether your personal statement should be A, that personal, um, and B, especially if you're looking at clinical fields, medical fields, um, whether you should be kind of pathologizing yourself, so treating yourself as a subject. I tend to lean towards the perspective of it's fine as long as you are smart about the amount of information that you provide. So the, the aspect of my essay that focuses on kind of me and my medical history um, is only really the first paragraph, which is about, let's see, one, two, three sentences. And the rest of the essay doesn't really touch on it at all. So I think that that was an appropriate amount of disclosure. It's also not a topic that is particularly, not polarizing, but it's not um, something that might be regarded as a potential deficit on my application, um, unlike things like talking about mental health issues. Um, so I think that talking about stuff like that is totally fine. So next up, I started talking about what I wanted to do in grad school. Um, apparently I specifically want to research brain machine interfaces or cardioelectric implants. This is interesting in hindsight because I don't know that I was ever that interested in cardioelectric implants. Brain machine interfaces and machine learning have definitely been up my alley for a while, but cardiac stuff has never really been anything that I've been super interested in. All right, looking further, I... Oh, this is something that you do in every essay, um, where I say, however, there are few academic institutions that have the resources, the intellectual curiosity, and the translational abilities to perform truly interdisciplinary biomedical research that can be implemented in real time in the clinic. I think that's true when it comes to my program. I still think that that's true. Um, but every grad school essay has a sentence that's something along the lines of, Therefore, this is the best place for me to do my PhD because it has XYZ things. Um, so it's always a little bit funny to read stuff like that in hindsight and see kind of what things I highlighted for each school. So next up, I basically run through all of my research experiences up to date. The important thing here is to mostly highlight um, what you did, what you had like intellectual ownership over, and then like what the results were, and especially if you like presented or published anything, definitely mention that. The research journey part of my essay is, I would call it probably about half of the total essay. So I think that's fine. Different schools have different rules on how long a personal statement should be, what should be in it, um, anything like that. So I think that what I did here made sense for the program I was applying to. There were other programs I applied to where you know, this was two essays where one was specifically about research and the other one was about more personal interests. Now this is an interesting part, I'm actually probably going to blur this out um, in the video, but 
for every essay I wrote, I did have a paragraph that was essentially, if admitted to this program, here are the people I wanted to work with. And in hindsight, it's super interesting to see what names came up. All of these people, I think, are great researchers, but I've definitely strayed pretty far away from everything that I mentioned in this essay. And I think that's fine. Um, I think the purpose of this paragraph is mostly to highlight that you did the work in order to be able to say, you know, here are the specific people in your department or your program that I'm interested in working with. Here's specifically what I might be interested in working with them on. Most of the specifics that I wrote about here, I actually pulled essentially from the discussion sections of their papers. <laughs> um, so I would go look at their most recent work and then go to the discussion and basically find you know, the part of the discussion that says further work should be done on blah, 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 blah. So highly recommend doing that. It shows that you've done your homework. It also gives you a sense of like what the lab is currently doing because a lot of labs don't update their lab website. Um, and so you might have a bunch of people in mind that you want to work with in a program and then you end up looking at their recent papers and realize that the things that you thought they were doing are not actually the things that they do. All right, getting to the end of my personal statement. So the second to last paragraph, and I could say this is a formula that I used for all my personal statements. The second to last paragraph is essentially highlighting my extracurriculars, outreach, leadership, things like that, to show that I am a well-rounded person who is not, you know, only going to be in lab 24 seven, but I will also contribute to the department, things like that. And then of course the last paragraph ends up kind of being a summary paragraph um, that explains what you want to do, why this is the program that you can do that in, um, what you will give back as a graduate of that program, and just kind of wrapping things up. So yeah, it's definitely interesting to look at this in hindsight, um, and just to see how much my research interests have changed. Um, but it is a little bit fun to look back at the journey as a whole, um, and think about, you know, if I had to rewrite this now, it would definitely be a very different essay, but there would definitely be some similar themes, I think. Moving on to my CV, which will probably actually be the more interesting part for a lot of you. I don't have the part at the top that you do on a resume that says like, you know, what you're interested in doing. Um, for a CV, I don't think that that's particularly necessary, and also they're going to read your personal statement anyway, so it ends up just being kind of redundant. As you can see, I had all of my stuff from my undergrad, um, doing my BS in biomedical engineering, doing concentration in bio, in bio instrumentation and imaging, doing a minor in computer science. Um, something that might surprise some of you is my cumulative GPA, um, which is not perfect. <laughs> um, I think it's something that I feel like it's important to highlight just to remind people that, you know, Grades aren't everything, especially when you're applying to PhD programs, grades really aren't everything. Um, neither are test scores, even though I did do pretty well in the GRE. And so you can end up at programs like the ones that I'm in without like a perfect 4.0 GPA. Next up, I have my academic research and industry experience. So I locked everything kind of research related under one heading. One thing I don't necessarily recommend doing is what I did here, um, which is have like a summary sentence and then bullet points of what I did. I don't know why I did both. I don't think you need the summary sentence. I don't think it adds anything to this. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing this on your CV, but I did. It turned out fine. Um, I also wouldn't necessarily recommend having formatting things this way in terms of the headers for each role that you had because especially if I'm looking at my Cornell research, like this is just super long <laughs> and like not very clear. So wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that. I actually have um, my current CV on my website if you're curious as to what my CV formatting looks like now. Um, I do it in LaTeX, so I also don't use Word anymore, but just something that I would maybe keep in mind for the future. So after this, I have a section on publications. Um, how you order your CV depends a lot on the position that you're applying to. So in this case, since I'm applying to PhD programs, I think it makes the most sense to basically front load things that they would care more about, which in this case are research experience, publications, and presentations. I have two publications on here that are both abstract slash posters for different conferences. I also have presentations. I think in hindsight, I wouldn't have put the second one on there. Um, it's a hackathon presentation where we're basically doing a pitch competition. It's not really the same as presenting a poster at a conference. And I think at best it ends up being confusing and at worst it ends up being like a little bit disingenuous. So I wouldn't have necessarily done that. I also have projects on here. I think that that's definitely more 
interesting, useful for people who are more on the industry side of things, less so on the academic side, um, and then skills, um, which should actually be at the bottom. This should either be at the bottom of your resume or at the bottom of your CV. There's no reason that this should be this early on. And then academic teaching experience. Both of these should actually be higher. Both of these should probably be under presentations. Yes, both of these should be under presentations um, because academic teaching experience is something that people care about when you're applying to a PhD program. And then I have leadership and academic outreach experience. This also probably should have been higher. Basically, the, the whole skills and projects section should basically be moved to the bottom and everything else should be moved up. And then last but not least, I had honors and awards. I think some of this also could have been moved up or maybe not. This section I think matters a little bit less unless you're getting an award that's like nationally recognized or, you know, best poster at a conference or something like that, um, which none of these are. So something I might have taken out or cut down on if I were to do this again, but I don't think it's something that necessarily had like a huge negative impact on my application. So I will stop there if you want to check out the video where I react to the grades that got me into grad school, you should head on over to Nebula. If you haven't already heard, Nebula is a streaming platform built by me and some of my friends, including people like Tirzu, Simon Clark, and Marquez Brownlee. On Nebula, you can find ad-free versions of all of our videos, plus bonus content in our Nebula Plus videos for those times when you want to see me react to my grades from undergrad, which was an experience for me. You'd also get access to our Nebula Originals, which you can't find anywhere else, including a very good trivia show where I competed against Brian from Real Engineering and Dave from City Beautiful in a bunch of fun and bizarre challenges, including trying to build an IKEA chair while answering math problems. And the best way to sign up for Nebula is actually through CuriosityStream, who are kindly sponsoring today's video. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service with thousands of documentaries and non-fiction videos. In fact, if you're interested in behind-the-scenes content from another one of my friends, I would highly recommend checking out their documentary Behind the Spotlight which tells the story of how Mr. Beast became Mr. Beast. CuriosityStream loves independent creators and wants to help us grow our platform, so if you click on the link in the description or use my promo code JORDAN, you can get access to CuriosityStream for 26% off their annual plans, with Nebula included for free for as long as you are a CuriosityStream member. That's less than $15 a year. Signing up for CuriosityStream is a great way to directly support my channel while getting to watch my videos ad-free, so sign up for CuriosityStream and Nebula at CuriosityStream.com JORDAN or using the promo code JORDAN. Otherwise, you can check out some of my other PhD-related videos up here. You can follow me on all my various socials down here, and I will see you all next week. Bye.